Michael Tonsmeyer joins me this week to talk about sour beer brewing. This is Beersmith Podcast number 209. This is Beersmith Podcast number 209. It's late February 2020. Michael Tonsmeyer joins me this week to discuss sour beer brewing. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Easy. Brew big and small spaces with the best all-grain ultra-compact system available. The Brew Brew Easy's revolutionary setup combines batch sparge efficiency, brew-in-a-bag simplicity, and the work clarification of a rim system. It's easy to set up, easy to operate, and easy on the eyes. Add the optional Brew Commander for precise temperature control and mash automation. With a Brew Easy, you'll discover definitive proof that size isn't everything. Electric and propane models are available. It's also the system that I brew on. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I urge you to give Beersmith 3 software a try. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support to the Beer Beersmith platform along with new integrated water profile and mash pH tools. Dozens of new features, including cloud folders, updated databases, support for fruit, juice, and honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Michael Tonsmeyer. Michael is the author of the book, American Sour Beers, as well as author of the blog, The Mad Fermentationist. Michael is also the award, an award-winning brewer, certified beer judge, and founder of the brewery Sapwood Cellars, where he joins us from today in Columbia, Maryland. How are you, Michael? It's it's uh, good to be here. I'm I'm doing well. It's nice to be talking to you from somewhere other than my bedroom. Your uh, your bar's not too busy today. I can see it there in the background. No, we're just open Wednesday to Sunday, and it's a it's a, a gray Tuesday evening, and uh, so it's pretty quiet back there. <laughs> So how how are things going? I uh, we talked uh, I don't know about fifteen ep- ten or fifteen episodes ago about Sapwood Cellars and uh, and uh, you were just in the middle of opening it at the time. Yeah, it's it's still going great. I mean, I'm still not regretting uh, leaving my my desk job of eleven years to do beer stuff every day. Um, we just hired a, a full time brewer, and so now we've got someone else cleaning kegs in addition to uh, my partner Scott and myself. And we're waiting on some new tanks and filling barrels and filling bottles. And it's, it's an experience. And I, uh, I don't know, I'd recommend it to every home brewer, but certainly if, if uh, beer is your life, you might as well get paid for it. It, uh, it certainly looks more cozy than, um, than a cubicle there. I don't know. Yeah. A little, little, little bit in the, uh, the, the, the beverages are a little bit better too. That's true. Um, well, today you wanted to talk a little bit about your book, uh, Sour American Beer, and some of the new developments you've learned since you published the thing. Why don't we start with talking a little bit about the book itself and uh, you know when you published it and so on. Sure. Um, it came out in, I think, 2014. I'd worked on it for about three years before that, um, first on my own and then with Brewers Publications sort of backing, and we had a bunch of great editors. Um but honestly, sour beer in America has really only been a, a big topic for, say, maybe maybe 20 years now, but probably a little less than that. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that the book is already six years old, um, a lot has changed since then. And, um, you know, being a blogger for a long time, it was it was always great that you could always post an update or, um, you know, change, change your opinion on something. And, and one of the issues with the book is, at the moment, it's out there. There's been um, one revision that was just little ticky-tack stuff. You know, this this was really on that page, or I misspelled a, a Belgian town's name, or something along those lines. But um, there have been a lot of changes to how brewers approach sour beers. There's been new research. There have been new um, techniques that brewers have sort of gone after. And um, it's it's nice to have a little, let's say, mid, mid-cycle update, hopefully in four or five years, I, I do another book, um, you know, with my professional experience kicking in. And, um, but before then it's sort of nice to, um, take a, take stock of where we are. 
And you mentioned there's been a lot of new research on sour beers. Uh, I think there's also a lot more resources available now, right? Yeah, and when when I first started making sour beers, you know, it was really Jeff uh, Jeff Sparrow's uh, Wild Brewing or Wild Wild Brews, um, which was just sort of about lambic and Flemish red and uh, Ode Brune, and you know, my my blog became sort of a, a source for people, but it was really just sort of this ad hoc, you know, um, what I did on that batch or what my opinion was, you know, over time changing. And so I I think the book was well timed, and and you know, I've I've talked to you know hundreds of home brewers and dozens of, uh, of professional brewers about, you know, that, you know, it gave them the confidence to start or that it kicked them off in the right direction, but they've, you know, sort of found their own path after that. Um, but more recently, um, resources like the, the sour hour podcast has been fantastic from uh, Jay at the rare barrel and the milk, the funk group, which is a, a huge group of uh, home brewers and, and craft brewers uh, on Facebook. And they have a wiki page, and it's great just because there there are all these sources for information on um, the science, the practical questions, the flavor combination questions. Um, not to mention, you know, podcasts like your own that now have you know pretty regularly on somebody who does uh, is from a yeast lab or uh, a brewery that specializes in spontaneous fermentation or um, all those sort of great um, you know professional thoughtful uh people who who have opinions and and think of ways to do things that i wouldn't have even imagined uh if you'd given me a hundred uh, years to write the book and uh the other thing is i think there's been a quite an expansion of commercial beers too here at least here in the u.s that are sour right yeah and, and not only just the number of beers that are sour but the number of breweries that are almost entirely uh focused on sour beer um places like Casey Brewing and Blending Black Project Holy Mountain Santa Darius um that really um i i think with beer the more you can focus on one thing the better you get at it um if you're a brewery that that does a, a lot of IPAs you're going to learn about hop selection and dry hop timing and whirlpool temperature and yeast interactions and sort of the same thing for sour beers once you learn how to use fruit and where to source barrels from and the best sources of microbes, you can apply those lessons to all of your beers and really just sort of keep raising that quality, that consistency, um, and, and get a product that is something that's difficult for someone who only does a sour beer once a year to, to sort of see that, um, that level of quality. And if I, the last time we chatted, I think you were doing uh, a number of sour and, and barrel aged beers too, right? Yeah, with with you know, like uh, like any any kind of uh, long term project like that, it, it's taken a long time for us to get to the point where it's uh, uh, something we can do regularly. Um, and so we opened in September 2018, and our first sour barrel aged mixed fermentation with Britannomyces barrel aged sour funky beer was a year later. It was September 2019, and we've done ten releases since then. Um, we've got one coming up this weekend that was aged in gin barrels. We've got a, an Imperial Flanders Red, like a 10% Vin de Cereal we aged in port barrels that uh, we're blending uh, later this week. And we've got a Dark Saison that was uh, soured in local red wine barrels that's going on to figs. Um, and so we've now finally got that 60, 60 or so barrels of stock that we can blend and we can put onto fruit. Um, and the idea is that we just keep refilling those barrels as time goes on and um, luckily so far, the response has been fantastic. The, the bottles sell out usually within a week or two, and we've got a, a sour beer club that people uh, sort of buy into and they get bottles as the year goes on. And it's, it's been a really, um, exciting and rewarding couple of months for us. That's something I was going to ask. Are you doing, are most of these special releases or do you actually have, are you getting to the point where you have sour beers on tap regularly now? So we, we have some sort of, let's call them quicker sours. We don't do a lot of kettle souring, but we'll add lactobacillus to get the acid and then ferment it out either with 100% brett or um, a Saison yeast or something like that. And those are on tap regularly, and we'll do some um, like keg condition, naturally conditioned, Berliner Weiss, Goza, Saison. Um, they have a little funk and some acid. But for the most part, the barrel age stuff is just bottles. Um, we do try to keep bottles around, so we have in-house options. Um, and now we've started the last couple of Sundays, but it, it won't continue indefinitely. Um, we uh, put cases of beer uh, away. We reserve them from releases and then have vintage Sundays where a case of uh, this last Sunday was an apricot beer that we did. We take out a case and it's available for in-house consumption just to add a little bit more depth. Uh, we only have 10 taps, and so it's 
um, there's always a struggle to have a real variety of beers available. So uh, back to the book, uh, American Sour Beers. Um, what are some of the things you think you got wrong in the book? You said now that you maybe got a couple things uh, not quite right. Sure. I mean, to me, I, the, the sort of the two biggest areas were um, about lactobacillus and about uh, Brettois. And, okay. you know, I'd, I'd like to say that neither of these is on me, but, you know, it's, it's, it's your book and you put your stamp on it. And uh, I got some stuff wrong. <laughs> so, so you want to go over uh, maybe the first one there? Lactobacillus, I guess. Sure. So one, one of the things and I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've got a quote from the book. Uh, if you want to attempt uh, this, so I was talking about doing a, a, a fermentation with only lactobacillus, um, you, need a, you need a highly attenuative, heterofermentative lactobacillus strain like White Labs uh, WLP 677. Okay. Um, that seemed like good advice at the time. I talked to a brewer that said that they pitched pretty much just lactobacillus. Sure, they had a little bit of yeast in there. Um, I'd tried it. I'd pitched just a, a tube of lactobacillus that I'd grown up in it fermented out to 80% attenuation. And, uh, you know, cer certainly I, I didn't really know what was in there other than I tossed this tube in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, about a year after the book came out, uh, Lance Shanner of Omega Labs did a test where he added super pure strains of uh, lactobacillus. He added a, um, I think it was like cyclohexamine, uh, so an, uh, an antifungal uh, uh, an addition that would kill any yeast. Okay. Um, and he checked on sort of what amount of alcohol, what amount of uh, attenuation he would get from various white labs, Y yeast, Omega lab strains. And the answer was pretty much a, a mo the most he got out of any of them was in fact that white labs, Lactobacillus dobrucki I677, but it was only 0.3% alcohol. So that's um, not uh, not a lot of fermentation going on there. Nope. Huh? And and the, the beer went from 1.037 to 1.032 or 3. Is that um, the so pH really, or, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, gravity. Oh, gravity, yeah. So did it generate any significant sourness? Did the pH drop a lot or not? Yeah, uh, that, that one went down to 3.72 pH. Um, okay. But it's amazing. Some of the other ones, like the, the White Labs uh, Lactobacillus brevis, only took the gravity down four points, and it got down to 3.14, so extremely sour with only 0.1% alcohol. Um, and so really that's the answer. So sweet you, and sour at that point, right? Yeah, but that really you need a, a, a yeast of some sort if you want alcohol, either Britannomyces or Saccharomyces. Something has to take the rest of those carbohydrates and turn them rather than into, um, you know, most mostly are sort of a, a decent amount of lactic acid. So I assume, I assume probably even when we're doing kettle souring, there's probably some wild yeast going on there or maybe some of the other experiments you did, there's some wild yeast there. Exactly. And, and I, I do not have a lab training and I'm sure with, with me growing up the cells, it probably wasn't, you know, we always talk about, um, sanitation, not sterilization in brewing, but with, um, yeast propagation, sterilization, you know, uh, can be a, a real thing you need. If a couple of cells of yeast get in there, they can grow. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, the tip, the, the takeaway for me is that if you add, uh, if you think you're just souring, you have just lactobacillus you've added, and you start seeing a lot of CO2 production, if you start seeing that gravity really dropping, odds are some wild yeast has gotten in there. And that's not necessarily the 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 end of the the world or anything like that, but um, it's good and to I, be you know, I would assume if you're doing kettle souring, that probably is happening, right? I mean, because yeah, you do see it, fermentation go on, right? Yeah, you you might see just, just a little bit. Um, I've gone to, when I do kettle souring, I no longer use... Um, like a uh, uh, wild culture from, say, grain, I buy, and usually it's the Omega Labs uh, lactobacillus blend. It's consistent, it makes acid, but it doesn't do much else, and it does it very quickly. So does that uh, have any yeast in it, or is it still no, just a... No, it's 100%. It's, it's just, it's 100%, it's just uh, lactobacillus uh, brevis and lactobacillus plantarum. Um, and it's amazing how quickly lactobacillus grows. Even on this scale, we're doing, say, a 300-gallon batch. I'll make a one-gallon starter of lactobacillus 24 hours before, and I'll see that that gravity drop down. Uh, I'm sorry, the pH drop down into the mid threes within 18 to 24 hours. So it doesn't take much, huh? No, it, it's those those bacteria, uh, bacteria are pretty cells, effective, huh? <laughs> yeah, they can double every about 20 minutes. I I don't remember the exact number, but essentially, if you double every 20 minutes for 24 hours, you could go from one cell to it's 57 to, to, to filling real. the entire world, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's under ideal conditions and all that, but. Um, I've talked to a couple of local brewers who had had been buying, you know, 
three or four hundred dollar commercial pitches of lactobacillus. And I said, you can get an eight dollar homebrew pack and you can grow your own and, um, you know, get get as quick or quicker results. Interesting. Um, as long, again, as you're being clean and you're, you're following your, your best process for keeping uh, unwanted microbes out of there. So you mentioned a second mistake, and I, I, I apologize. It, it slips my mind at the moment, but what was the second one you were going to Sure. So the, the second one was, again, it was probably about a year later. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, White Labs had been advertising uh, Britannomyces uh, Trois. And it was their version of sort of a fruity, good for primary fermentation, um, strain. And so is that a, say, hey, that's a Britannomyces with some est- high ester production or how's exactly. it? Yeah. Okay. Big tropical esters. Great, great for like, um, a hundred percent bread IPA or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were, um, marking is, is equivalent to another commercial strain from uh, BSI, which is a commercial, um, specific yeast, uh, supplier out in Colorado. And I talked about them as if they'd been, if they were the same strain and I'd, I'd use them and here's my hundred percent bread IPA recipe. And it came out from White Labs. They did a little genetic test when they were sort of ramping up their their microbiology program and, and gene testing everything. In fact, it was a wild Saccharomyces strain. So rather than being uh, Britannomyces Trois, they've now re- rebranded as uh, Sac Trois. And it's still available. And I, I really appreciate that just the fact that they were wrong about what species it was or what, what genus it was doesn't change the fact that it was a great yeast that made a, a, a really fruity, fun uh, product it it well, makes Saccharum- it Saccharomyces, of course, is yeast, right? So it's got it's got a yeast it, apparently a yeast to bacteria blend. Then I guess no, no, no. no. So it, it, they just misidentified it. So okay. it was they had what they thought was a Britannomyces, and in fact, it was a Saccharomyces. So it's one of those things that until you put it into a PCR and identify what genes it has, microbiology is a little trickier. You know, it's not it's not quite as um, clear cut and obvious just from looking under a microscope or something like that. Um, and they rebranded it. Now they have, uh, they have, uh, what is it called? Vrai. It's the Britannomyces Trois Vrai. It's the true uh, Brett Trois. And so now they've just, they sell both strains and you can choose between them depending on what flavors you're looking for, what attenuation you're looking for. Um, if you're comfortable using Britannomyces, you know, some people might use the Sac Trois and be, be comfortable using that on their non sour equipment, on sharing equipment with a clean um, uh, strain. And so that's, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, but you know, I, I really appreciate when a lab sort of owns up to, you know, a mislabeling, a misbranding and, um, says, Hey, it's still a good product and we're still going to keep using it and keep selling it. And, uh, we've used it on a couple of beers here at the brewery and I used, kept using it at home. It's a, it's a good strain. It's just not technically a Britannomyces. Right. But Chris White doesn't make any mistakes. So that's surprising you, yeah. right? None, yeah. none of us do. I've, yeah. I've certainly never, uh, ne- never made a beer. He's a, he's a good friend. He's good. <laughs> um, so, uh, what are some of the new topics you're looking at, uh, for the next edition you mentioned? Sure. Um, there, there are a couple big ones. Um, I really didn't get much into, um, sort of the, the commercial side of things and, you know, things like, Hey, um, bottle conditioning at home. I'd, I'd add some sugar, maybe I'd toss a little dry yeast into the bucket, and, you know, two weeks later, six weeks later, five months later, the beer would be carbonated almost all the time, and that was good enough for me. Yep. That wasn't on a production schedule. Well, now I'm at this brewery, now we're trying to, you know, you, you don't want now, to sit Now you're worried about shelf bottle. stability, right? Yeah, and, and so we're, you know, there's a lot out there on um, acid shock tolerance, on you know, a very low pH is not a happy place for dry yeast to wake up. And uh, the techniques that you can get into for acclimating yeast to that lower uh, pH and getting them so they're really ready to go as soon as the uh, the sugar's added and bottle condition's ready. Um, now, hey, also, we're going we're gonna to cover that in just a minute, too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's also uh, lactic acid production by yeast. So that was, again, it's probably, I, I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but I'm sure I said, if a beer is sour, bacteria is involved either lactobacillus or uh, pediococcus or acetobacter. Acid production is by bacteria, fermentations by yeast. It turns out that's not correct. Um, there are a bunch of strains out there, and now a lot of uh, labs have started isolating them and propagating them and selecting them that will do everything. It's, all, it's almost like a kettle sour all-in-one microbe. It will make lactic acid. It will make a- uh, alcohol. It will um, sort of knock out the whole process by itself. And maybe or maybe not make some fun flavors. Very cool. 
So uh, can you give us some examples of those strains? Are they commercially available now? Yeah, so it's it, it's a little bit of a, a tricky area. This is one of those areas where people are attempting to um, patent the process. Okay. So there are certain labs, uh, there are a couple of um, uh, labs at colleges that have said, hey, we've applied for a patent. To make a sour beer, you pitch this particular strain of this microbe, and it makes a sour beer. Um, there are luckily a couple of suppliers um, Wild Pitch East Co., uh, Maniacal, Maine Iacal, um, and I'm sure a few others, but like those are the two I've 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 worked with, and and sort of you know um, their strains have been um, interesting. Um, some of the strains are sort of you know you may have heard of before. Um, Hanziaspora is uh, I I talked about it a couple of times in the book. It's also called Chlorecala. Um, it's supposed to, uh, Vinnie Chulerzo from Russian River talked about having a culture at his brewery, sort of a wild culture that made these fun, like grapefruit flavors. Mm-hmm. He, I'm sorry, I should say he attributes some of the flavors they get, these like big citrusy flavors in their spontaneous fermentations to this microbe, which they have, um, in their blend or in their wild culture. Um, and then they're like, like wicker hamomyces and schizosaccharomyces, um, and a lot of these strains that people find, they are just like out there in the world. Um, I know so are, a lot most of wild- are most of these coming from wild yeast sources, just wild yeah. stuff laying around. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, I know the ones from wild pitch yeast co, I think both of them were cultured off of trees from his parents' house in Pennsylvania. And he was just going around swabbing sounds stuff. Like, sounds like brewing in Belgium or something, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's, it's that, but it's a little bit more controlled because they're isolating them out. Um, but really, that's that's sort of the thing with microbes is that there are hundreds of millions of strains that haven't been identified, that have been identified during a bank. And just figuring out, like, well, one, like, sure, they make lactic acid, but, like, can they tolerate, you know, 5 or 6% alcohol? Can they – do they make flavors that are pleasant? You know, you, you could make a, a perfect pH and have great attenuation, but if it makes your beer t- taste like rotten garbage, it's not, not really that good. Yeah, I've had some wild um, yeast uh, fermented beers that weren't, weren't to my taste anyways. I don't know. Precisely. And, <laughs> and some of that may be the strain, but some of it may just be learning, well, this isn't Saccharomyces. What's the right pitching rate? What's the right aeration level? What's the right nutrient amount? What's the right – um, what other kinds of ingredients does it play well with? Um, does it have fun interactions with hops? Does it um, do anything interesting with fruit? And that's really now where you know there's only so much a scientist can do before brewers just need to do that legwork of trying things out, seeing what works. Um, you know, just like I mean, essentially that's where most beer styles come from is that you know people try something and refine it and figure out what works and what doesn't work and and goes from there. Um, and so. I, I think they're really it's um it's a unique idea. Um, it's nice in the sense that you don't have to worry about like a blend of yeast and bacteria where if you repitched it, the ratio of the different microbes would go um, go one way or the other. You know the bacteria probably reproduces more quickly. Um, you also don't have to worry about um, hopping rate nearly as much. Um, lactobacillus generally is only tolerant to. Maybe five IBUs, best case scenario, 10 or 15. So if you want to do something that has, you know, acid and uh, hop aroma, it can be very difficult to do that with bacteria. You might have to sour first and then heat it back up and add some hops and then ferment it with yeast and then dry hop. And it's a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of timing, a lot of consideration. Um, it's a lot easier with one of these strains where you can simply make the wort like you normally would and pitch the yeast and... A couple weeks later, you have sour beer. Mm. Um, that that was one of my issues with the ones I tried is they they were a little slow fermenting. Um, Matt Bachman from Wild Pitch uh, East Co sent me samples. I think I pitched the 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 tubes they sent me like two days after he propagated them, and a week later, both of them were at about twenty five percent attenuation. Mm. Which I mean, I just can't imagine being at a particularly a production scale and having, you know, 25% attenuation after a week. And it, it, they both finished out. They both got to, you know, 70% attenuation or so. Um, but it took a while, but it took a while and, yeah. and it took considerably longer than a kettle sour would granted. It was a lot easier. There wasn't that, you know, waiting for the right pH. Um, but then you don't have that same level of control with a kettle sour. You can wait until it's exactly the pH you want 
then you can heat it. Um, what we do is we'll often just add some um, pre-isomerized hop extract if we're just doing it in a tank. When it hits you know 3.4 pH, we add a little hexalone or a little tetralone, get that get that lactobacillus to stop, and then let the yeast take over from there. <laughs> um, and and so it's it's an interesting idea. Um, I I I think it just needs that refinement on again what flavors are right what timing is right what pitching rates are right maybe it needed more n- more nutrient maybe it needed more oxygen than i expected um yeah so i, I used it it was uh, yh72 which is hansia spora vinei and yh82 which was wicker hamomyces anomalous um i believe he does not generally sell to home brewers although um, I don't know. I, I, last I talked to him um, a, a few months ago, they were working on a partnership that would make these strains more widely available, but I haven't heard anything since then. Well, we're um, looking forward to that. Um, that'll yeah. Be great. yeah. I, I just love <laughs> options. I mean, that's that's the great thing, you know, with whether it's hops or malts, you know, if if we all only use the same yeast and the same three malts and the same two hops, we're all making the same beer. Um, great to have, you know, other options, other flavors out there. Well, uh, can you talk a little bit more about kettle sour? Maybe just give us a quick overview. I know uh, a lot of people may or may not be familiar with it, but it's become really popular, obviously, because uh, it's shorter production times, right? Yeah, I, I think kettle sour, I mean, quick sours and kettle sours are great. Um, they will never be the same thing as a barrel age, mixed ferment, sour beer with Britannomyces and, and all that. But if what you're looking for is some acidity to balance out a beer rather than bitterness, Right. Almost all beers are on sort of that sweet to bitter kind of spectrum. Sourness is a whole other kind of, you know, uh, Venn diagram or whatever it is. Well, can you walk us through the process real quick? Yeah. Only because it's something people can fairly easily do at home, you know? Yeah. And so generally what I suggest is um, get a pack of lactobacillus that you trust. I like either a, a lactobacillus brevis or a plantarum. You can get those from a Y yeast or a White Labs or an Omega, or you can also go to your local supermarket and get a Good Belly Probiotic or their probiotic pills. But no matter what one of those sources you pick, I would go with um, something fresh, something in code, whatever it is, and then make a starter of it the day before. I usually just use a weak uh, dry malt extract, just sort of like you would for yeast, but maybe more to like 1020 rather than 1040. Mm -hmm. No hops. Um, you know, make the starter and chill it down to say 95 degrees and pitch your lacto. Um, by the next day, it should be tart. Um, usually, you know, making yogurt or something with lactobacillus, 24 hours is usually about all it takes. You mentioned, you mentioned how fast they reproduce. So yeah, exactly. And so really what I'm interested in is just making sure I have a, a healthy, active culture. I never want to have warm wort that I'm not pitching something into that I'm confident about. Mm-hmm. Whether that is I'm pitching yeast or I'm pitching lactobacillus, I just want to make sure whatever it is is rare and to go and is going to do the work of protecting the word so that some awful bacteria doesn't move in that either tastes terrible or, or makes me sick. Um, and so I would make my word just like normal. I wouldn't add any hops. I'm I'm in the camp of um, there's no reason to add three IBUs of Hallertau. Uh, it's just not going to... Budweiser's 12 IBUs. If you're making three IBUs, you're not going to taste it, but there is some chance that that three IBUs will cause trouble for the lactobacillus. Um, I think one one thing people don't realize is that um, as the pH gets lower, as more acid is produced, Mm -hmm. the hop acids become more damaging to lactobacillus. Mm -hmm. So even if it starts souring okay and it gets down from, you know, 5 pH down to 3.8, well, that might be enough acid that now those hop acids are really going to cause trouble and the lactobacillus is going to stop souring. Interesting. Um, and so I would, I would just leave hops out. I, and it's not just IBUs. It can even so dry you, hops. Are you talking about in your starter or just the, the whole thing? The whole thing. Unless, and, and so like what I do for a sour IPA is once it gets to my desired pH, um, generally you pasteurize the wort, so you bring it back up to 175, 180. You could boil it even at that point if you wanted to, but then you could add your hops. Um, right. At that point, I would, I would, I like adding the hops at 175 or 180. You won't get a lot of bitterness from them. So no. if you're just looking for a hop flavor, a hop aroma, that's a great time to add uh, the hops with uh, a sour base. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there, you've you've heated up. Um, again, I like having a pH meter um, to test the pH before I make that decision. Right. And I mean, what are we shoot? What are we shooting for here uh, in terms of a kettle sour pH? It, 
It depends. We've we've found that three five or three six is not nearly as sour as most beer drinkers want their sour beer to be, and so we've we've moved most of our quick sours down to three three to three four seems to be mm-hmm. the good spot for us. Um, it really depends, though, if you're adding in a lot of um, sweeter flavors, like pastry sours are now the the cool thing. So essentially, sour beer with lactose and vanilla and um, you know desserty fruit kind of flavors. Hmm. You could probably go for an even lower pH on that because you're going to have all this sweetness to balance it out. And that's really the problem with tasting the wort um, bef- after souring, but before fermentation, is you still have most of the malt sweetness there. And so a, even a beer that's at 3.3 or 3.4 won't taste super sour. Right. Um, it's much like soda. A lot of soda is like 3.1 or 3.2 pH, but we just don't realize it because it has all of the sugar uh, laid on top of that. Right. But once fermentation's done, all that sweetness is gone. All of a sudden, it really will uh, will have some punch to it. Yeah, that makes sense. So then uh, I assume you just finish it out uh, much like you would a regular uh, beer. You just add the yeast and let it go, right? Yeah. The, the only sort of um, point of warning I would give would be that that low pH is stressful stressful on the yeast. Um, and particularly once you get down below 3.1 or so. Um, yeah, I, I know. I, pass- I actually make a lot of meads, and, and it's very easy for them to drop below 3, and then it they, you know it starts stopping, and then you end up with a yeast, you know, mead that's insanely insanely sweet. Um, yeah, sweet. And yeah, and sweet and sour can balance, but it's it's nice if you're intending it to ferment, ferment out that it does. So, for example, I would add um, nutrient, yeast nutrient, after souring. Just mm-hmm. to make sure there there is fan that there are you know microbe uh, microbe accessible zinc and all those other things that yeast crave because lactobacillus may have used up a lot of that. Now, um, do you I ever also- do you ever try and raise the pH or you ever, you ever get in a situation where you have to? You know, sometimes when I'm doing the meads, I do have to raise the pH, uh, potassium bicarbonate, something like that. Yeah, you know, I I haven't yet. Um, luckily we just sort of, because it's my full-time job, we just sort of monitor while souring's happening and sort of catch it at the right point. Um, for, for stouts and things like that, we'll just use baking soda, but yeah, something like potassium bicarbonate, if you don't want to add sodium, seems like a great idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so I, I pitch like a big starter of yeast, you know, make sure it's like maybe 50% more, you know, think of it more like a lager repitch rather than an ale repitch. Um, you will, we'll talk about it a little bit, um, you know, uh, acclimating the yeast, but I generally don't find that to be necessary for primary fermentation just because there's a lot of sugar. I'm not pushing the pH too low. Um, right. and then also think about the strain you're using. Um, I think most strains are okay down to, to three, two or three, three, but once you start going lower, um, a lot of cold strains are good. Um, something like French Saison is pretty unstoppable. Or you might want to start thinking about like 100% Britannomyces or the, the Sactois, something something that's going to be a little hardier um, and not just be able to start that that fermentation, but be able to um, finish it out. Right. And you, I mean, and, you probably don't want the pH to go that low anyways, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, it's all, I mean, anything like this, it's personal taste. Um, yeah. And so- I like the acidity to balance out the flavors, but some people really want to get socked with uh, with a big acid, you know, rip your tongue off kind of thing. Just, you know, there are always people who want a thousand IBUs and there's always people who want a, a, a 3.0 sour. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other sort of, you know, sort of general tips. Yeah. And the, the nice thing about kettle sours at that point, you've, you've boiled it. And so the lactobacillus is dead. So you don't have to worry about cross contamination with your other equipment or anything like that. And, and it's uh, the other big advantage. I was just very fast, right? Yep, exactly. It's very quick. Um, uh, if you're planning to add fruit, I wouldn't wait until fermentation's entirely done. I would add it, um, as fermentation's maybe slowing down a little bit. Uh, we had a batch that we added fruit, I think probably a week after fermentation um, started. So maybe two or three days after it really was done. And it took about four days to see any re-fermentation of that fruit sugar. Um, and we were getting to that point where we were all nervous of if, I mean, it tasted good. A little bit of sweetness doesn't, you know, balance as a sour. But if it then starts re-fermenting in the keg or, or the bottle, you're in real trouble. Well, um, another, another thing to be aware of, depending on the fruit, the, a lot of fruits are acidic and they can drive the pH down even further, actually. Exactly. Yeah. And that's it's something you really need to think about of where's your target pH and how much fruit are you adding? And, and is it something like blackberries? They're going to add a lot of acid or is it something maybe like a, a peach or something the like ex- that? Extreme would be like black currants, right? Or cranberries, exactly. cranberries drive it way down to a lot yeah. of acidity. Um, so, uh, switching top, you pretty much covered kettle selling. Let's switch topics to, uh, acid shock. Uh, what yeah. is that? 
Yeah, so um, yeast essentially have a reaction when they get exposed to acid. They just need to – they stop what they're doing. They halt growth, um, and they need time to adapt. Um, and they change the way their metabolism goes, and they, if they are tolerant, will have this acid shock response and acid ad adaptation, and then they'll get going. Um, so again, I generally don't find this to be a problem for kettle sours. You certainly could um, acclimate your uh, primary fermentation yeast to acid, um, but so far I haven't found it to be an issue as long as you're sort of above, say, 3.2. So you mentioned so it's, it's more of a problem with bottling, I guess? Yeah, for bottle conditioning, um, that just that's the worst place to wake up. There's almost no sugar, there's no oxygen, there's acid, there's no nutrients. There are stress, you know, stress uh, releases from uh, the the yeast that autolyzes. Um, and if you just toss some dry yeast in on top of your bottling bucket, most of that yeast is going to die. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a third of the cells if you're lucky, but it might be all of them. Um, I usually use wine yeast and wine yeast is more tolerant of acid just because, uh, you know, whether it's mead or whether it's a grape wine, you know, those tend to be pretty acidic already. They've been selected for. Yeah. I mean, they get down close to three, but again, if they drop up much below three, they die. So. Yeah. Um, and so this would be particularly valuable, say, if you had a, a house ale strain, if you were planning on adding American ale yeast, which is just it, you know, Sierra Nevada or where, wherever American ale is from. They never have sour beer. That yeast is is not ready for it. Um, and so, so, again, uh, so, so walk us through this process of acclimating yeast, I guess, trying sure. to get it used so to I, the acidity. Yeah, so it, it really all came from uh, Matt Bachman, uh, again, of Wild Pitch East Kobe. He's also a, a PhD at uh, oh, University of Indiana at Champlain or something like that. I apologize, Matt, if you're listening. Um and so he had been contacted by Upland Brewing, which is also in uh, Indiana. And they said, hey, we've got this sour beer and we add yeast. We add our, our healthy culture of, you know, active fermenting yeast and nothing happens. They, they, beer just sits in the bottle for, you know, three months or six months and nothing happens. And, you know, we, we don't know what to do. Um, and so he sort of looked at the biology of it and um, he came up with this, pro this process. Mm -hmm. um, it is the sort of thing that it seems like you would do in a yeast lab. You um, take the starter culture, you mix it with very specific things like yeast extract peptones. Um, and so you get this sort of super fortified yeast, and then you blend in some of the beer that you're going to add it to. Um, and what that does is you're sort of essentially diluting the acidity of that beer with that starter culture. I, and I assume you do it over time too, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so you're giving it like 24 hours of sort of like almost training wheels. You're giving the yeast time to say, like, hey, something's coming. Get ready for it. And then you can pitch that whole thing in. I think it um, kind of like um, for really high-gravity meads, you're actually worried about this thing called osmotic shock, where there's too much sugar in the in, in the wort or must, literally. And um, you have to slowly introduce the yeast or it'll, it'll just die, you know. Exactly. I've, I've been making some wines at home, and that seems to be a pretty common um, process in wine where you – take your rehydrated yeast and you every, every few minutes you add a little bit of the, um, the must to it just to, again, yeah, like, like bring it up to speed slowly. Um, and so luckily, um, and, and I would suggest that your, your, uh, listeners go to, to milk and, and look for acid shock starters. Um, there's five or six different methods that people, um, either escarpment labs or. And then I, I want to make the point, this is something you can do at home, right? Exactly. But so what they've done is that they've come up with more um, homebrew friendly um, ingredients and techniques um, that essentially like, I mean, there's, there's nothing magic about this particular um, uh, combination of time, but, you know, sort of, uh, you know, getting the yeast rehydrated is, is a big step. Um, and and, and right. at a minimum, I would say, even if you don't want to go through all of this, Rehydrate your yeast first by the manufacturer's directions. If you want to use a product, product like GoFirm, which is a, a rehydration yep, nutrient. GoFirm is uh, very good. And that's And that's what we do. We, we just rehydrate with GoFirm, make sure the temperature is pretty close, and we just put that in. Um, if you then want to go sort of that next step, people have different um, suggestions on, you know, sometimes it's using apple juice because that's a simple, you know, carbohydrate compared to malt. You may not want to be adding a whole bunch of malt extract, which is um, partially fermentable by, by the wine yeast you're adding, but also uh, fermentable by Britannomyces. You may want to be using more simple sugars if you're going to be propagating them. Mm -hmm. 
And then they have, you know, particular times, you know, th use this amount of go firm for that amount of time at that temperature and then cool it. And then, you know, over and over. Um, but, but generally the idea is to, um, you know, mix the, the starter with about an equal amount of the beer, give it 24 hours and then pitch that whole thing. So get ready the day before. And honestly, it makes bottling day easier because now you've got the yeast already rehydrated, already acclimated. You don't have to go through that whole process at the same time you're cleaning bottles and setting everything up. Um, and that's just, it's a great way to ensure you're going to get a quick fermentation, which will also help to protect the beer from oxygen. It will help to prevent the Britannomyces sometimes will kick off like a weird, like like uh, like a weird secondary fermentation where it then produces a lot of weird byproducts like uh, tetrahydropyridine, which is that sort of like toasty flavor that some people call mousy. Sounds delicious. People. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's this to me. I pick up as like a weird. It, it it tastes like I just ate a bowl of Cheerios. That like weird lingering cereal grainy sort of flavor. Um, and, and it's one of the worst things you can do is learn to identify it because you'll start tasting it in kettle sours and, and American sour beers, pale, pale sour beers in particular. Um, it usually goes away. The Brett will eventually clean it up. But again, if you're hoping the beer is going to be ready soon, having a, a big, healthy, quick, active fermentation is the best thing you can do for it. Nice. Um, well, do you have any additional tips you picked up since you wrote uh, American sour beers? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 weird being at at this you know coming from a home brewing background and and opening a brewery where I helped out at breweries like Modern Times before we opened, but this was sort of my first time brewing at this scale. I was never a head brewer anywhere. I was never a, a, a keg washing intern. Um, and honestly, the same sort of things for sour beer apply to um, just you know making hoppy beers or stouts or whatever. All the all almost all the science is the same. I mean, the same sorts of you know the same mash temperature gets the same sorts of results. The same pitching rates. You know, you're just scaling things differently when you're doing the recipe and you're, um, you know, trying to make uh, recipes that you know have whole sacks of grain rather than 40 pounds out of this this sack and 38 pounds out of that sack. Um, but it's really just sort of the physics of the whole thing. You know, how do you move 300 gallons of beer? Um, you know, that's a lot of weight, a lot of pressure, a lot of speed. And it's sort of the same thing with sour beer. You know, I, I used to just do fruit by, you know, going to the farmer's market and cutting up five pounds of peaches and put them in a, in a, a, a carboy and, or a bucket and siphon word onto their siphon, um, fermented sour beer onto it. And now, just at that, this scale. Do, do the same thing with 500 pounds, right? You know, we, we actually do sometimes, <laughs> uh. And, and that's, that's the sort of thing, you know, you can scale up cutting up peaches. Um, what's harder is figuring out what kind of vessel to put them in and how to get that beer back off of the fruit again. You know, we're not big enough to have a centrifuge. We don't filter beer. Um, what we've done is uh, my partner, Scott Janish has worked for a long time and gotten some custom stuff from uh, Utah biodiesel. And their original business was just that they were making these sort of uh, stainless uh, filters and screens for people to filter, you know, cooking grease, um, and right. use the oil to run their car. Biodiesel, bio right? Exactly. And and the same sorts of things work great for getting fruit out. Um, and so we've got a bunch of big plastic winemaking totes that we um, put the fruit into. We purge them with CO2. And then we transfer the beer from the barrel onto there and let it re-ferment and then take it back out. There's a little racking arm and we have a, a stopper with a, one of these little screens stuck on top of it. And it works, it works pretty well. And you know, we, we haven't had anything sort of jam up. We actually had the most problem with a batch that had uh, puree. Uh, it was a uh, heavily apricotted beer. With I actually don't oh. use, I, for the most part, I don't use puree anymore for that exact reason. Yep. And, I'd and rather it, use wine base or fruit or almost anything else. Ex exactly. And, and we hadn't had trouble with it in our real fermenters for sort of, you know, beers because we can chill the whole thing. It's got a conical and we can dump the fruit out the bottom and we tried it and we put a screen on and the puree was too thick and it plugged up the screen. And then we had to come out and we had to transfer back and forth between about three different tanks just to get most of the puree out. And we ended up with some kegs that were about half puree. And it's just like, you know, it's a, it, it was a valuable lesson to learn <laughs> uh, that puree is not, is not that great unless you have a way to um, pull off above it. Um, and yeah, I, I really didn't use puree much at home because you, you, the losses, you know, you'd, you'd add a bunch of puree and you'd end up with, you know, a third of your batch was, um, was gunk. Yeah. I don't, uh, don't use it at all actually anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've, we've, we now use, I mean, when it's in season, we try to get fresh and local, but we'll use dried fruit and we've used 
juice and citrus zest and yep, as you said, almost anything other than puree. Yeah. Um, but no, most most of the things at this scale, yeah, it's just like learning how to move things around and you know dealing with you know I I had two big barrels at home and now we've got sixty five of them, mm-hmm. um, and just you know learning that I mean, for us now it's really blending is the the big difference at home. Blending was something I did very rarely because I just didn't have, you know, four different carboys of the same sour beer that I could pick and choose from. Um, and not only blending to flavor, but then having to worry about, um, well, if you're blending one barrel that has a higher gravity and one with a lower, you know, how much um, fermentation are you going to expect in the bottle? You know, do you need right. to Stability. undercarbonate to leave room for that or, um, you know, what, what do you, you know, hey, you've got four barrels of this beer do you want to blend the two best ones to make a really terrific beer and leave the two um, mediocre barrels? Do you want to throw them out? Do you want to put those onto fruit? Do you want to um, those sorts of things? Um, and and for us, sort of generally, the rule is um, bad beer goes down the drain, great beer gets bottled as is, and beer that say isn't sour enough maybe goes onto fruit, but that's otherwise very good because fruit, as we talked about, is great at adding some acidity and it's will feed the microbes and it has acid and it it just um, and it adds some interest. If your beer is a little boring, it's a way to give it a little, um, a unique character. Well, uh, we're actually coming up to the end of our time, Michael, but I wanted to give you a minute or two, just say a little bit about Sapwood Cellars, maybe tell folks where, where you are, how to get their uh, website and so on. Um, sure. And, uh, and uh, that's about it. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's weird just doing something like this every day. And we've, we've been lucky so far that, you know, we're, we're in a, like a random office park in Columbia, Maryland, um, you know, we aren't allowed to have much of a sign out by the street and, and luckily thanks to Google and, and my blog and, uh, my partner, Scott Janish.com, Scott's blog. Um, you know, people find us, people come out of their way. We've got a, a cool tasting room. Uh, we've got a, a great staff, a bunch of home brewers work here, uh, part-time and our bar manager is a home brewer and, um, and folks you know, may not know it, where's Columbia too, not too oh, far yeah, off from it's, Baltimore. It's, we're, we're not too far off in of 95, but we're sort of between, uh, Baltimore and DC. Right. Um, so if you're, if you're ever sort of driving up 95 is sort of the, you know, East coast corridor from, uh, from Boston to, I don't know, Florida somewhere, I assume, um, we're right off of there. We're very close to BWI airport. So if you ever happen to be flying in or out of the area, we're not quite as close as the gigantic Guinness factory that's right there, but we are, <laughs> we are one of the closest breweries to BWI and, um, most, if not all of our beer is usually served from the tap room. Um, that's, that's where the, uh, the margins are. And as a former economist, I couldn't justify, uh, making $50 a keg, sending kegs out the door. So we, uh, we sell uh, pints over the bar and, uh, balls to go and, and hopefully very soon cans to go. We, uh, we're, we're getting some new tanks and hopefully, uh, we'll regularly have packaged beer to go. So it's been an adventure so far. It's only been a year and a half. Well, Michael, I uh, really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks again for coming and talking uh, about some of the things you learned about sour beers. Uh, great to have you here today. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, timing worked out perfectly. About eight minutes from now, my old homebrew buddy is coming to uh, blend uh, Dark Saison with me. Nice. Well, again, my guest today was uh, Michael Tonsmeyer. He's the author of the book, American Sour Beers, and also has a brewery called Sapwood Cellars, which you can find in Columbia, Maryland. Thanks again, Michael. Yep. Thanks, Brad. A big thank you to Michael Tonsmeyer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Brew Easy. Brew big and small spaces with the best all-grain ultra-compact system available. The Brew Easy's revolutionary setup combines batch barge efficiency, brew in a bag simplicity, and the work clarification of a rim system. It's easy to set up, easy to operate, and easy on the eyes. Electric and propane models are available. It's also the system that I personally brew on. Visit BlickmanEngineering.com for more information. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And Beersmith 3 is available on both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider support, new Whirlpool hop options, support for high-altitude beer brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-J trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 